afternoon, everybody. A very warm welcome to you all at what is our eighth and final webinar in this series. So thank you all for joining us. Um, for anybody joining today who don't know us, we are Irish in Britain and we're a membership organisation supporting a network of Irish organisations across Britain and supporting the growth, the well-being and the work of the wider Irish community. My name is Ashley McDowell. I will be hosting today's webinar. Before I hand over, I'll just run through some housekeeping for today's session. So this session is being recorded, but only our speaker and our panellists will appear on screen. The recording will be used as a resource and uploaded and accessible on our website as part of our dementia training and information. So you should have all received a link to our privacy policy in your invitation, but I will post that in the chat box once our session has begun. So as attendees, you are not visible and your microphones are on mute. If you look to the bottom of the screen, we have both a chat box and a Q&A box. So we encourage attendees and participants to post in those boxes if you have any questions or queries throughout the session, and I will be monitoring those throughout. And towards the end of the session, we will hold a space for question and answers. And just to say anyone attending today, if you don't wish to be emailed or contacted further regarding anything to do with these sessions, then you can let me know in the chat box, which I will be monitoring throughout. So what I'll do now is I will hand over to my colleague Zibi. Zibi is our Quivna Development Coordinator, and she will just speak briefly, and then she will hand over to our speaker for today. So if I just bring you in, Zibi. Hello, thank you, Ashling, and welcome to our, um, as Ashling says, the last of this series um, webinars under our Quivna programme at Irish in Britain. And Quivna is a word um, in Irish, which means memory. And um, today we are, very pleased to welcome Colette O'Driscoll um, to come and talk to us. And um, Colette is a Namaste Care Manager at St. Joseph's Hospice in East London, where she trains volunteers in Namaste Care, which is a special kind of sensory program to support people living with advanced dementia in the community. And um, we're delighted to welcome Colette today. Um, thank you. Oops. Hello everybody and thank you Ashling and Zibby for inviting me along today to talk about end of care and advanced dementia. I'd like to tell you a bit more about myself. My parents came like many Irish people to London in the 1950s and then I came to, to London in the 1980s after being educated in Ireland and with a degree in psychology. My first experience of working with people with dementia was as a student nurse in a psychiatric hospital just outside London. From there I went on to qualify as a social worker where my first job was actually in a care home which had a dementia unit. I have worked as an independent social worker reviewing care in care homes and nursing homes. I've also worked as a social worker in a community dementia team and worked as a dementia advisor in a memory clinic. For the past five years, I'm glad to say, I've enjoyed the therapeutic aspect of working as a Namaste care manager at St. Joseph's Hospice in East London. I have both a personal and professional interest in dementia. And I'd also like to say that St. Joseph's Hospice in East London was started in 1905, I think that's 115 years ago, by a group of, of Irish nuns who came over to East London who set up the hospice to, to reach out to the homeless and, and, and the poor. So, let's start. It's estimated that there are about 100, not 100, 10,000 Irish people living in Britain with dementia. I work in a very diverse ethnic community of people living with advanced dementia in East London. The majority of these people live in their own homes or in supported living or in a care or nursing home. Very few people with advanced dementia come to hospices and that I think is the general picture. I should move this on, it would be helpful. Okay. 
next slide. So today I'm here to talk about what is end of life care. But before I do that, why do we need to talk about end of life care? Dementia, dying and death are still taboo and still have a large stigma attached, although I think we are getting better. I feel we do need to speak openly so we can improve the quality of life now and in the future. This in turn will decrease our anxiety by making clear what happens in the future. It allows us to make more informed decision. So as the dementia progresses, carers need to make decisions on behalf of someone. It's easier to do this if the wishes are clear. My father-in-law did this for my mother-in-law at the sort of moderate stage of her dementia. And it's also knowing what to expect. What happens in terms of care at the end of life is something many people have not experienced death or somebody close to them. And it can help them to understand both the possible physical changes and symptoms, thereby avoiding unnecessary alarm and concern. So now I'm going to share with you what I hope we can cover in this seminar. So. I'd like to talk about what is end of life? What do we mean by end of life care? How might we recognize that end of life care is approaching, end of life rather is approaching? How might we provide quality care at this stage? And then to look at the sort of aftercare and resources that are available to carers once our loved one or cared for one has passed. So what is meant by end of life care, by end of life? If we look at the journey or the progress of dementia, it can be broadly divided into four stages, the early, the middle, the late and final stage. I have included a slide about this stage, but it, it's, it's quite busy, so it's there for your reference. So when I talk about advanced dementia and what I'm asking, yeah. Sorry, sorry to jump in there, Colette. I just make sure that you um, are sharing the slides. Um, just hope that I've set it up so that you can share them there. Yeah, uh, I think I have. Yes, I think we're on the right slide. Can you see it? End of life care? Um, I, I can't at the moment. Do you want to just try and screen share it again for us? OK, we will do. Sorry about that. No, not at all. Modern technology. Modern. Don't you love it? It's great when it works. <laughs> Isn't it's it? It's great when it works. So let me go into Zoom. Sorry. You're fine. Absolutely fine. No bother. Share screen. Here we go. Share. Okay. End of life. Perfect. From, from the beginning. Lovely. All right. Oh, are we on track? Thank Perfect. you, Ashley. That, Thanks, that's Helen. really helpful. Okay. No Thank you. All right. So cover that one. End of life. What is end of life? Right. Okay. So we talked about the stages, the four stages, the early, middle, the late, and the final stage. And I'm going to focus on the advanced dementia. And that looks at the late and the end stage of the dementia journey. Um, end of life and palliative care can cause confusion for people. They are not the same and they are sometimes used interchangeably. Palliative care is an approach to life limiting illnesses such as cancer. And it's about palliative care is about improving the quality of life for the person and their family. People should have a right to access end of life and palliative care services. End of life services should support people approaching end of life to live as well as possible until they draw their last breath. In terms of advanced dementia, the person is likely to have significant difficulties with the following. So once each person, I would have to say, is unique in their journey with dementia. However, the disease that is dementia can impact on the person in the following way. So they will present with uh, memory and thinking difficulties. They may well mix up the recent and past events to finally, they may have no awareness of past or future. They may forget friends and relatives and confuse their children with their parents and have difficulty following commands. In terms of their communication, they will struggle to have meaningful conversations and end up at the stage where perhaps they're using less words to the stage where 
perhaps they will become non-verbal. In terms of their mobility, it will gradually decrease. In terms of their eating and their weight loss, they will lose their appetite and may potentially end up also with swallowing problems or swallowing difficulties. In terms of incontinence, there is loss of bowel and bladder control and also issues to do with their balance, which will gradually um, get, become increasingly difficult. There will be perhaps a decline in their ability to show a range of emotions. They may sleep more and spend let most of their time asleep. In terms of points that trigger end of life care discussions, it is important. There are sort of following change points on the dementia journey that are worth talking about. In terms of, it is never too soon too soon is never too soon when it comes to talking about end of life and dementia. And for most people, it will arise at the time of diagnosis. End of life discussions can happen and usually do at a memory clinic. Usually people are given a pack, information and advice about wills, lasting power of attorney, advanced decisions to refuse treatment and finding support. This is a lot to take in at this appointment because it takes, it when it comes to processing in the first instance, the shock of receiving a diagnosis of dementia. The message here is really to, to, to speak about end of life and have those discussions early on. So be it at the point of um, somebody receiving a care package to an admission, perhaps to um, an acute hospital with dehydration or with a chest infection, or where you're perhaps maybe considering residential care because the package of care needs to be increased further. Um, so these are the perhaps transition points that where people will trigger an end of life conversation. There's also perhaps healthcare events that also trigger these conversations, where there is, as we said, as I said earlier, a deterioration or a decline in the person's health condition. People not only live with dementia, but they also can live with other conditions. And that can be with diabetes, with kidney failure, with heart failure. And these can have an impact as well on, on the dementia. Um, there can also be difficulty, difficulty with nutrition and hydration. Um, in, in terms of nutrition, let's say if somebody had advanced dementia and they were a Diabetic, one of the features could be that perhaps maybe one person might develop a sweet tooth over time and therefore perhaps maybe only eat biscuits, which, which would then impact on their diabetes. In terms of hydration, it is an issue for some where perhaps maybe they felt they've already had a drink or they don't want to drink because they feel perhaps they're going to be incontinent or they can't find the toilet. So these are the sort of difficulties that, that can arise and make situations more complex. In terms of responding to antibiotics, sometimes over time people can become resistant to antibiotics and can have a series of infections which are sometimes characteristics, characteristic of dementia. In terms of um, when people have to go for perhaps further investigations, um, um, it can also trigger discussions about end of life and what perhaps is in place in terms of, of, of their wishes and whether they would need perhaps further treatment or what were their views before their, after the dementia was diagnosed, what was the views of the person living with dementia. Also, I think that when somebody is living with dementia, there's always an issue, not always, there's usually that conversation about whether the person is for resuscitation, CPR. This perhaps is usually asked at the point of entry to a nursing home, usually when people are admitted perhaps via a &E, it is a question that is usually put to relatives that can be quite upsetting and quite shocking in, in the first instance, but um, it is asked time and time again. So whilst end of life discussions are sometimes triggered by a person's health, don't despair if you haven't been able to have that chat about end of life. Things are not set in stone. And when conversations are held, um, it's the start of a process. It is a process. 
So talk about your wishes is an ongoing conversation that takes place over many years. This is the, um, the slide and the, and the uh, what's the word? It, it, sorry, I'm losing my words here. This is actually um, a very helpful uh, slide that I've got from the Irish Hospice Foundation. I've put it in in terms of it might be useful for some people as a, res a reference point just to look at the stages in, in dementia, but I'm not going to dwell on that here because it's not fair on people who are using their phones and their tablets. So I'm going to move on to look at the advanced stages of, of dementia. So in terms of the advanced stages of dementia, I have to say in the first instance, um, dementia can be very end stage and end of life dementia can be very difficult to gauge. And um, it can sometimes perhaps maybe take place over a period of one and a half to two years, and that can be considered the perhaps maybe advanced stage. And in the, um, and sometimes at this stage, there's a lot of focus on the disease effects. And, and also it's, it's important to, to look at achieving comfort. Generally, I would say to you to sort of keep in mind, what would you want for yourself if you were in that position? And what would you want if you were dying? So I would also want to say that there can be a series of what we call false dawns and false alarms. And the impact on the family is great as you have been living with this for years with the diagnosis of dementia and also the inevitability of death. However, the unpredictable nature of dying is, is certainly an emotional roller coaster and should not be underestimated. Therefore, um, it's important to support everybody involved. I remember when my mother was at end of life care in a, in a care home and we were called by the care staff there when they thought she might be closer to the end. We had at least three journeys over two years of the last two years of her life that were false alarms and she rallied back. Clearly, she was not ready to go at that point. End of life. How do we know and recognize that end of life is approaching? I think what's key here is knowing the patient, understanding the person, following their wishes and providing the individual care that you give. And that is key to delivering quality care at end of life. Hopefully you're carrying out their choices and respecting their wishes. And this is important as we know, just not just for the, for the person, but also for their family. One of the challenges as death approaches is where the person wants to die and their preferred place of care. It's important to recognize that the place of death is simply not simply about the patient choice, but the complexity of dying. And that would take into account things like family dynamics, the availability of services at the time, just to name a few. Nonetheless, we need to consider that a good death is for people to be able to die in the place they want to. In order for this to be achievable, the person's choice must be discussed and recorded so everyone is aware from the professionals involved to the support network of family and friends. The challenge is to ensure a distinction is made between a preferred place of care and a place of death, and these can differ. So some person may want to be cared for in hospital. However, as death approaches, they may want to go home or they may indeed want to go and receive hospice care to die. So some of the signs that it may be time, and here we're talking about perhaps maybe potentially the last few months, the last year, was a sign of repeated infections, perhaps maybe, you know, two or three chest infections in the space of, of, of a short time, maybe six months, a refusal to eat their food, even their favorite food. Sometimes they may hold food in their mouth and let it fall out. They may be having some soft, coughs and therefore perhaps in danger of choking. They might be sleeping a lot, withdrawing to bed. Um, they may have pain from the stiffness of laying in the same position all day for 24 hours and also because they need assistance to move. They may have wounds that don't heal, that don't respond to, to the treatment it's getting. They may have a dry mouth. They may uh, start to lose weight and they might be drifting in and out of awareness. However, the person is still with us 
and has still got some strengths and skills that we can't underestimate. So with the advanced stages of dementia, they are still able to make and respond to eye contact, to respond to sensory stimuli. Here we're talking about they have sight, albeit impaired for some, sound, some people may be deaf, but they have sight, they have sound, they have smell, they have taste, they have touch and also movement. They are able to feel and express a range of emotions, albeit for us that we need to interpret their meaning and what they need. And they also, more importantly, have a desire for human contact and connection. So when we talk about dementia care, we talk very much about person-centered care. And person-centered care is key in dementia. So it's about seeing the person first and not the illness. It's about being able to live well with dementia if you've got person-centered care, which will allow you to die well with dementia, which in turn will, allow, will enable you to have a good death. In the later stages of dementia, we have needs that are based on how we are feeling, our cultural, our spiritual and religious beliefs and practices. So it is through advanced care planning or the knowledge or our knowledge of the person and all those supporting the person, including the care professionals, that we should try to meet the needs as best we can. So for example, if the person is becoming distressed or depressed, doing small things can help a lot. So for example, talking to the person, brushing their hair, holding their hand, these meaningful connections like this can help you meet their emotional needs and help you also to be close to that person. Whenever possible, it's best to ensure the person is in a calm, familiar environment with people they are close to. The person might enjoy things that stimulate their senses, such as, um, such as familiar music, or aromas, perhaps maybe aromas such as lavender, and maybe even a little hand rub or a, or a hand massage. This was something that I did with my mother-in-law when I used to visit her, ever before I heard of Namaste. I would give her a hand massage and she would really enjoy that. The person's cultural needs should also be acknowledged and respected. Cultural needs can be influenced by a range of factors, such as where the person lives, their gender and their language. Talk to care staff about these needs and how they should be met. The person's spiritual needs will also be individual to them and may include questions about meaning, about faith and belief. These needs should be addressed and respected as much as the medical aspects of care. Personal or religious objects, symbols or rituals, including prayer or readings, may be used. People with Dementia, with advanced dementia, usually keep older memories for longer, so they may respond to things they recall from their earlier life, such as perhaps maybe readings or hymns. As a carer, you may have your own spiritual and cultural needs, and it is important that you are supported to express these and have them met. Talk to care staff about your feelings and what spiritual and faith-based support is available for you. When we talk about the needs of somebody with dementia, um, we're talking about um, the following, which is, is, is exhibited in this slide here. So people with um, advanced dementia still have the need to feel loved, to feel attached, to feel comfort, to have their unique identity respected, to be included, um, in the group, in the community they belong to, and to have a meaningful activity. So communicating with a person with dementia at end of life, nonverbal communication from you through gestures, through your body language, through your facial expressions, and touch can help. Use appropriate physical contact, such as holding your hands or a hug to reassure the person that you were there for them. Maintain eye contact as much as possible. Take your time and look for those non-verbal signals from the person with dementia. Continue talking to that person even if you don't think they can follow what you are saying. They may respond to the tone of your voice and feel a level of connection with you 
even if they don't understand what you were saying. Talk about things of interest to the person or reminisce about things from their past. The importance of communication cannot be underestimated at this stage and communication remains important throughout a person's journey with dementia. You can continue to communicate with a person living with advanced dementia and how we communicate, of course, will depend on the person's likes and preferences and hobbies and, and the work they did. Uh, it's interesting to note that we communicate where words are only make up 10% of that, the tone of our voice is 35%. And interestingly, our body language is as much as 55%. So when we communicate with somebody non-verbally, watch their eyes, we're reading their facial expression and they will let you know whether or not they're in pain. If a person with dementia is unable to say they are in pain, but show some of, of some behaviors, it is useful to look for, for other possible causes. For example, are they hungry? Are they thirsty? Are they too hot? Maybe they're too cold. Is the environment calm? Is it supportive? Could they be anxious? Are they upset? Jumped on a bit, sorry. The uh, hearing, I have to say, is the last sense to go. So it's always, always talk to them and explain what's happening and what is it you're going to do when you interact with them. So there are several different approaches to dementia care. There's the Friedner project that you're all here familiar with, the culturally sensitive community service for Irish people here in Britain. And there's also a project in Ireland called SONUS, which is largely delivered in care homes. The project I'm familiar with is Namaste Care, which is a sensory program. Namaste Care aims to enhance the quality of life in the later stages of dementia, and it helps when people can feel isolated and unable to join in with activities around them. It was developed by Joyce Simard, you see there on the screen in America, and Namaste Care helps the person to remain connected to others by focusing on their emotional as well as their physical needs. Namaste is a Hindu term and it means to honor the spirit within. And this is what Namaste carers do by engaging in a person's senses through sound, through touch, through smell, through taste and sight. And this can include hand massage or sharing food or drink. The person's life history is used to tailor Namaste interventions for that person. So a former, let's say, GAA hurler or footballer could benefit from interacting with a ball or a slither, while for perhaps maybe for a knitter, it could be a ball of wool or a twiddle cuff. Joyce wrote about um, Nama, end of life and Namaste care. This is the second edition of her book, which is there on the screen. But I'd also like to introduce you to a book written by a colleague of mine last year, Nicola Kendall. Um, this book is about Namaste care in Britain. Um, she attended our Namaste training at St. Joseph's Hospice. And Joyce made the comment about this book in terms of, and this book was written specifically as well with carers, as well as professionals in mind. And it, she talks about the various ways carers can touch the hearts of those who have difficulty communicating. Nicola's dad lives with dementia, so she has direct experience as a carer, as well as a very accomplished and uh, accomplished, and she is an authority on Namaste care. So I'd like really to talk to you quick, to talk to you just about the key core elements of the Namaste care program. So the Namaste, First, and, and more importantly, before I talk about the Namaste Care Program, any program or sensory intervention that you do with anybody living with um, um, dementia, advanced dementia, is that it's pointless to attempt any activities with that person to improve their quality of life and well-being if they are in pain. So again, what I would sort of say is make sure, sure you do your, your own quick pain assessment. So that said, we can then sort of look at the key components. So, it is made up of sensory stimulation, which is again about smell. The sense of smell is very powerful for people. 
scents and smells, of course, can create a link and bring back reassuring memories of times gone by. So maybe the smell of, of big soda bread will always remind me of my grandmother or a favorite perfume. I remember my father-in-law uh, would spray um, his wife with um, her favorite perfume at night when she went to sleep. Also, so the second sense about touch, here when we talk about namaste, the emphasis is on slowing things down and it's on that loving touch. And that again, as I've said earlier, can be hand-holding, it can be stroking a person's face or arm, it can be about brushing their hair, it can be very soothing and reassuring. And then of course, that's pivotal to making a connection with that person. In terms of vision, of course, family photographs or a photo of a place of significance can produce a reaction and stimulate memory. The sound of music, playing a favorite song that, that can bring back memories. Someone who lived in the countryside might react to a bird song, or perhaps if they lived by the wild Atlantic way, it may be the sounds of crashing waves. For some, the music of course could be jigs and reels or the sound of Kaylee or show band music might be their preference or like, it's important to know. In terms of singing, often people with dementia who stops speaking a long time ago can sing along to a familiar tune, as I'm sure you're aware, and remember all the words. And we would also perhaps even use maybe nursery rhymes and hymns. So part of this program, apart from sensory stimulate, both to stimulate and to soothe and relax, we would also use meaningful activity. And that meaningful activity um, is, is based on the work they used to do, their hobbies, their interests, their preferences. In terms of their life story, we would do some life story work, which is similar um, to the Kuevna project. And an important element too, as part of this session, would be treating it as a pamper session. So we would introduce food treats and hydration. Uh, there's, I'm just gonna quickly say something about people have heard about jelly drops. They've come out in, in the last few months and they are a great way for people with advanced dementia to take these sweets that are jelly drops that will hydrate them. I'll, I'll give the link later to, to Ashling. But just to say again that, um, these are the core elements of the, NAS, the Namaste program that also include the use of memory boxes and life stories. And I know that's key to the work of the, Queen, the Queevna project, as well as Namaste Care, where we try to capture, to some degree, the essence of the person's life. These are some of the aids we use to find out more about the person and what was important and influential in their life in terms of story work and memory boxes. Life story work informs the activities you might do. And at this stage, it's just careful to select the activities that they still enjoy. I'm now just going to perhaps share a case study with you um, to demonstrate the elements involved in end of life and namaste care. Um, this is a, an 85 year old Irish woman with advanced dementia, and she was living at home with her son and daughter and she had worked as a carer in her local hospital. And from her life story, what we found out, she came from Cork when she was 18 years old. Um, Mary had Namaste care for an hour every week, and her Namaste program consisted of a loving touch massage with lavender. She enjoyed hair stroking. She liked two pillows to be puffed up. She had her own special blanket. In terms of sounds, she enjoyed the music in particular of Jim Reeves. And she also liked to sing along to, if you are familiar and come from Cork, the banks of my own lovely Lee. I won't give you a rendition now, perhaps later. Also too, she enjoyed the exchange of, in, in terms of using some Irish words. So the volunteer would say Sloan and, and greet her in Irish. And that would bring a smile to her face. In terms of the scent she, she enjoyed, she enjoyed a massage with lavender that relaxed her, or sometimes maybe the scent of roses also put a smile on her face. She also enjoyed in terms of um, ice creams on, and, and during the winter, that winter, somebody brought some snow in and she enjoyed not only touching it, but tasting it. 
in terms of her visual work, we did some life story work and she had a memory box. As I said, Mary had namaste care for about an hour every week. And her daughter mentioned her mom appeared far more relaxed and care staff knew she had had a namaste session, which it was far easier to, for her to move and she appeared more content and relaxed. So I want to share a quote with you from someone living with dementia to remind us that your smile, your laugh, your touch are what we connect with. Empathy heals. Just love us as we are. We're still here in emotion and spirit. If only you could find us. And that's a quote from Christine Bryden, who's written a book called Dancing with Dementia. So now I want to look at the role of the professional carer. As somebody um, who, and as I said, I mentioned earlier, who may provide palliative care and, and end of life services. And it's important if someone nears the end of the, their life, there will be important decisions to make, including whether they should be resuscitated if they have a heart attack, whether they wish to, where they wish to die, and any religious practices they may or may not want observed. If the person with dementia has previously had open discussions about their future wishes and preferences in terms of what we call advanced care planning, it will be easier to act on their wishes when they are no longer able to decide. Health and social care professionals should always involve you in decisions about the person and discuss with you in a sensitive and straightforward way. If a person with dementia is unable to say they are in pain, but shows in some of the behavior, as I said earlier, it's useful to look for other possible causes, um, whether they're hungry or thirsty. I've mentioned this before in terms of pain management. It, it is a big thing for me, but just in terms of, I'll leave it there. I think I've made that point. As it can be grossly underestimated, they say perhaps up to 30% of people with advanced dementia um, have not had their pain managed as, as well as it could be. Right. Most people find it difficult to come to terms with the person when dementia, with dementia approaching end of life. Many carers say they are grieving over time while the person is alive and as the dementia progresses. This may be because of the dementia progressing over such a long period of time and the changes they are seeing in the person. You should tell health and social care professionals about your own wishes as carers, including whether you have this want to say goodbye to the person and whether you want to be with them at that end of life, if this is possible. Caring for somebody at the end of life can be a rewarding experience and a time of great closeness. Carers who have supported the person through dying and death often value this as an important memory. After the person has passed away, as a carer, you will experience and approach bereavement in your own way. And it is important that you are supported to grieve as you need and as you want to. You may experience a range of emotions, including numbness, finding it difficult to accept the situation, anger, regret, sadness, relief, difficult to accept the situation, feeling lost and losing a sense of purpose. You may feel very strong emotions or you may feel that you have no strong emotions left. Sometimes other people may assume that you have already grieved for the person with dementia as their condition has worsened. Whether or not this is something you felt, many people will still grieve when the person dies. Um, I put a link there to the um, Alzheimer's um, organization where there is, 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 is a lot of information on how to get help in terms of grief, loss and bereavement. In terms of aftercare for carers around grief and loss and emotions, 
um, I think it's important to say that the period around the funeral is often a time when others offer most support. Afterwards, you may need time to adjust to no longer caring for the person. And this is sometimes called delayed bereavement. You may need to rebuild friendships that your caring role had put on hold. You may continue to need emotional support during this time, but you may find that fewer people offer it. Talking through your feelings with family and close friends can often provide comfort. So try to tell people when you feel you need this support. If you need more support or are becoming depressed, which is different from grieving, ask your GP about local bereavement services or contact Cruise Bereavement Care, or there's usually perhaps your local carer centre, they might also be able to help. Organisations such as Carers UK, Carers Trust, Cruise, the Citizens Advice Bureau um, can also help, as well as Dementia UK. And I, I'm aware that you've had Admiral Nurses from Dementia UK and other people may have mentioned this as well. I'd now like to share a link with you. And this is a trailer for a new film called Finding Jack Charlton. This is a touching film about a great hero for Ireland and an honorary Irishman and how his life has been chronicled in terms of the person he was and his achievements and his celebrations of life. This film is due for release in the end of November and the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland have endorsed this film as a charity partner. I have included a link to the trailer of the film and Ashling is also going to put it up in the chat room, so I believe. Thank you, Ashling. You can get to look at it on the Alzheimer's of Ireland website. In fact, it's also on YouTube and it is worth a look at for the trailer at least. The main message I have today, my final message is, I hope this session will encourage you to start this conversation about end of life care and dementia. Thank you for listening. Back to you, Ashley and Zibby. Thank you so much, um, Colette. Um, if we could ask you perhaps to stop um, slide sharing and we'll put the link into the, the chat function. Okay. And then for the rest of this session, um, it's our time for people to ask questions and we'll be putting questions to you, some that we've had in already. Um, firstly, I just want to say a big thank you because you've um, opened a very difficult topic or a topic that can be very difficult about end of life care, very sensitively and also very practically as well. Um, and thank you for all of the thoughts that you've shared. Um, and to remind people watching um, about a resource that we've created at Irish in Britain, I don't know whether you can see it, which I'll hold up, um, which is a My Story book, which um, you can find out more about through our website and we'll put the link into the, the chat function as well. But it's a resource where um, people um, can come together in families or with friends to create a very person-centered um, resource, a, a, like a coffee table book that can, be taken by people into care homes or into hospitals and it can help to introduce that person to the, the care staff and the professionals that come and engage with them in a way that really emphasises their personhood. Um, and we liked very much what you were saying, um, Colette, about the importance of, of understanding who the person is behind the diagnosis of dementia so that end of life care or, or any care indeed can be really tailored to that person. So thank you so much for that. Um, we've had a question that came in um, from somebody, somebody about um, their neighbour. And I know in your talk, you emphasised um, the importance of carers looking after themselves and reaching out to friends and family um, where they may feel down. But this is a sort of the other way around. This is a neighbour of somebody um, who's um, asked us to ask you um, what they could do um, where they're worried about um, their, their neighbour, who is a carer for somebody living with dementia, who has um, moved into a, a care home and 
the person, um, the, the person, the family member caring has been um, very much um, caring 24 seven for a long time and putting aside a lot of their hobbies and their social activities to focus on that person. And now the um, person they've cared for has moved into a care home and um, they're feeling quite down about it. So this is an observation from the neighbor wondering what, what, can, what other people in the community can do to support somebody who's, who's lost to some extent, the, many of the, the activities that they were doing as a carer as the person's um, dementia has progressed. Thank you. Thank you, Zibi. I think it's great that that person has noticed and it's come to their attention and they clearly have some concern about the, 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 the person's welfare. The fact that you have noticed, perhaps maybe the next step might be bravely to, to knock on the door and see how they are. Sometimes I suppose when people have died, people can avoid people for a while out of respect, but also perhaps maybe that they're not sure whether to approach. So maybe you're slipping a note under the door perhaps to sort of say, you know, hello, how are you keeping? Would it be okay if, if I popped a, you know, um, would you be happy to have a chat, be it a telephone call? Um, I think maybe, as you said, having, respecting the having some distance but at the same time knowing that they're you're there to support them as and when they need it um you might be aware of perhaps maybe whether they have callers or not whether there are other perhaps uh, they may well be in contact with family members um i think at the moment this is really difficult because we're, we're in the middle of covid so i i'm aware that um we can only have one person visiting and the person has to be in a bubble, but it still, I suppose, doesn't stop us from being concerned and to go resort to the old fashioned methods of ringing up on the phone or slipping a note under the door if they were your next door neighbour. And I think reaching out to people, if, if people want to reach out, this is, um, this is the ideal time to do it. The communities have come together and are concerned and communities want to show their compassionate neighbour and how they are worried and concerned about people. So I, I would say um, it's great, to, you know, I would encourage them to take the next step and just inquire how that person is and be, be ruled by your own, by your own intuitive sense of, of how that person responds and, 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 and uh, trust your own instincts and whether you think it's the right time or they might need a few more days or weeks and gently encourage that person back and you know, I think so long as they know that there's a concerned neighbour next door and they've got their best interests and their welfare in mind and, and they're concerned about them, that in itself is, is, is a great start and, and take it from there. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Colette. I'm going to bring in now Dr Mary Tilkey, who's with us here as a panellist. And Mary, of course, um, is our Quivner patron with a great deal of expertise in this field. Um, Mary, would you like to put a question to Colette? Yes, um, I suppose, Colette, thank you. That's been a most interesting, practical and empathetic. Um, oh, sorry, I haven't put my video on. Yeah, a, a brilliant um, discussion about end of life care for people with dementia. It actually took account of the fact that people had dementia and it was predominantly Irish people we were talking about, although we share many of the same issues as, as everybody else. I suppose one of the, the things that I wanted to, just as more, more a comment really than a question, some people in our community were very worried some time back when there was very bad press about the Liverpool pathway. And then again, when there was recently, uh, at the start of the, of the pandemic, when people were supposedly asked by doctors, by their GPs, to sign uh, D DNR um, documents. And, and I think people are worried that their relatives, with, particularly with dementia, might just be dismissed and not treated because of their dementia. And I wonder if you've got any comments or any suggestions around that. <laughs> that that's it, <laughs> Mary. It's a million I mean, dollar one, I know. It's a million dollar. I mean, to, to be honest, I think if people go in, um, I think if people are living at home, what I see more really is, is people living at home who don't actually are even on a paracetamol. You know, they might be aged. I, I saw somebody three weeks ago and, and you know, who, were clearly not on any pain medication at all. 
and uh, clearly in need of Panadol. And clearly, too, um, my father is end of life care. And only this week we had an issue about pain and it's about taking Panadol. It's, it's the basic level. And, and I think there is that. So there's a the whole question of pain management. And, and also, I suppose, with the Liverpool pathway it came into disrepute because of what happened up in Liverpool and people thinking, you know, people being perhaps pushed over with morphine. And, and I think, you know, there's um, enough belt and braces in, in place and uh, to sort of still monitor that. But I, I, I do feel, um, so I probably lost the, the thread here, about pain management, pain control is, is for most people are living at home. Mm. The next lot, I think, are, are in care homes. And, and I think care home, it is a standard question when you do go in to consider DNR. And, and, and that is a difficult one. And, and, and I think sometimes um, it probably maybe uh, it, it takes it, it will come up maybe regularly at six monthly or, or yearly reviews where the person isn't for review. So it is open to change. It is open to discussion. And it's an ongoing discussion where that person, let's say, is in a care home. If they're living at home, I think, and they're living with advanced dementia, they're probably only asked really at the point of entry where perhaps they end up in an acute hospital or for, are they for DNR? And, you know, it's it's that discussion to have, as we said, at the very early stage of the yeah. point of diagnosis. Absolutely. It, it is really difficult. But um, and, and they will be asked when they're at, at acute hospital. And it's something that maybe the carer doesn't get used to. I, I know my husband, you know, would would fly home to see his mother. And then, you know, she fell one time and she broke her hip. And it's the first question he was asked, is she for, re you know, is she, is she for resource? And he thought, what, you know, what, what about? And it is, it's, it's a level of when you're on the receiving end of that. And it's a very difficult one for families to, to, to deal with as well, I think. What, what, um, yeah, I suppose it's a legitimate question to ask, but it's the way it, it's asked and when, and when it's asked, isn't it? That's right. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. I think when people are admitted via a and &E, I think you get used to it, maybe if you're going to get used to that question at all in a care yeah. home as it comes up on a regular basis. But if, if your loved one um, doesn't present to, to hospital that often, you're caring for them um, and lovingly at home, and then you get asked that, you know, when there's when there's all other things going on in the background or in terms of their complex health needs, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very difficult one to deal with. Uh, but I think sometimes I, I felt certainly with discussing this with my own family, even this week, was that um, explaining uh, what the emotional reaction their partner might be with a similar age, let's say, you know, my mother's, that they might say, no, they're for resource, I want them resuscitated. And I think sometimes let them have that emotional response, and then is to take to the side, maybe a few hours later the next day, and say, well, you know, given that, you know, what is involved, you know, this is the procedure yeah. that potentially happen. This is how many people can, uh, you know, it's in single numbers, the people who, who do recover um, in terms of CPR. If it's, yeah. and maybe sometimes people need a bit more information about that, but you almost have to get on them with that journey and have that discussion, that yeah. painful discussion, and, and start that as soon as you can. Mm, I think you're right. Um, I, the other question I wanted to ask was about pain, uh, pain management and um, you, you know as well as I do that there are lots of people in our community who won't even take a paracetamol. But families have great worries then about, oh, he started, they've given him morphine or they've given her morphine. And they see that as, you know, kind of, well, they, this is the end. And, you know, it, it isn't always. Do, do you want to say something about early pain management? I, I mean, yeah. Um... I mean, I deal, I have to say, with most of the people live in the community because so few come in to the hospice. Yeah. Mm. And it, it comes up, I suppose, I, I do find that sometimes I will ask about, um, and, and I'm not a nurse, I'm coming at it from a sort of so, psychosocial point of view. Mm. But sometimes, let's say, the volunteer who delivers the program, they see somebody and, and they're uncomfortable and, and, and it's, it, you know, they move their hand and they're, they're grimacing. And you think, is that person in pain? And if it continues, they may sort of raise it with the carer. And they might sort of say, they'd sort of feed it back. And if that went on for a while, let's say over two or three sessions, I would then perhaps maybe visit and sort of, uh, and sort of say, well, if, if they're reporting that continuously and maybe have that chat with the care about pain, pain management and, and how it can be assessed by a palliative care team or a doctor or a mm. district nurse. 
just to make sure. But I mean, I think maybe it's after the culture of opioid misuse in America or something. We all think we're sort of down that track. And I, and I think we're far from it at the moment because I think certainly people with advanced dementia more than any other condition, it is underestimated. And, and I yeah. think again, it's going back to looking at, I, I went to see somebody recently and I, I could see that um, the woman had just been started on, on, on paracetamol. And I said, do you think that's what she says? No, I know it doesn't. But I've told, she said, the, the nurse that I'll wait till next week to see how it goes. But I know they're in pain. And I was trying to say, well, you don't quite have to wait that long. We, we could ring them today. It's, I know it's Friday, but they would be still there if you were, oh, no, mm. no, I'll wait. And that probably is a, a typifies, as you said, the sort of situation that can arise in you. Yeah. Think, you know, don't be afraid to ring them up. They'll be fine and have that chat. You know this person best. You know, if you're saying they're in pain, they are in pain, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. It's just that little bit more difficult with somebody who has dementia. You have to, you know, they're not necessarily able to tell you. That's it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And you... You have to know them and know the little quirks and, and what perhaps where they're in discomfort from their facial gestures to they don't want to be moved to, you know, not to be touched. Or maybe sometimes too, people can get a bit agitated, you know, yeah. and it's about us who apparently got our full brain functioning as opposed to a brain that, that that's suffering from a disease and being attacked. That we have the, the, you know, we have to interpret what their behavior means and what what is the message they're trying to convey to yeah. us that they could potentially be in pain. And if not in pain, maybe there's another discomfort. They're too hot. They're too cold. But yeah. I mean, trust your instincts and and, uh, and and don't be afraid to raise it. It's better to raise it as an issue and have somebody somebody objectively assess it than let it go. Yeah. Thanks, Colette. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. Colette, just one more question before we will need to wrap up, which came in from somebody who was asking about um, changes in religion. And you did mention um, the importance of respecting people's cultural and religious or spiritual wishes and also um, taking care of the carer as well as the, the person living with dementia. So this is question is from somebody who said that their says that their dad um, um, was brought up as a Catholic and most of the family are Catholic and in his life he converted to become a Jehovah's Witness um, but since he's had dementia he's kind of gone back in his memory and um, is talking or is or appears to have kind of gone back into um, his first religion which was Catholicism and the family are now really confused about now they're thinking about um, what kind of care to give him and what kind of support now he's less able to express himself what what they should what should what they should do and where he should be placed and could you comment on that is it something that happens that's commonly a, that's an interesting and it's a good question and you know I think it it puts me in mind of the Alzheimer's um, explanation of, of memory loss and uh, you know you start off with your bookshelf and at the very end the, the books that are left when they are left at the very bottom and it's about taking you back to perhaps that 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 period in your life where you're a young person in your teens or a teenager and that's certainly at the advanced stage of dementia that's wh where you're at so I, I think and I, I suppose that's the first thing the second thing I would be led by the person living with dementia so if he has gone back it's it's, it's about respecting that and if he's now choosing and and it's not I mean it would seem that the Catholic faith is is now he's uh, important to him so i think respecting that acknowledging that if he needs an, any um sort of you know wishes to have i don't know rosary beads or, or prayer books or hymns that are of, of significance or important to him that will be part in one way of his comfort plan it's clear maybe that that's something that potentially could bring him a, a degree of comfort and that happens sometimes people during their adult life may uh, may lapse or, or or change religions or be absent from religion and it's interesting how when we go back in our heads and, and, and perhaps we're, we're at a different stage in an earlier stage in our life that those things might be a source of comfort they may not always be a source of comfort to people but where somebody is asking and they are comfort and you can see that then from their reaction if they're deriving some pleasure or comfort that's great on the other hand, if they're not, well, then maybe, um, you, you know, you would try something else. But it's getting those comfort objects and respecting their wishes 
and going along and being on the same page as the person that's that's possibly what I would do. Thank you so much Colette and um, thank you to everybody that's joined us today as well it's been such a um, useful and reflective um, session that you've given to us. Um, as um, Ashling said at the beginning, this is the last of a series of eight webinars that we've been running at Irish in Britain and we'd love to hear people's feedback and we're hoping to um, plan some more. Um, those of you who may be interested, at the same time next Wednesday, Dr Mary Tilkey will be talking about um, Irish um, people living with dementia under the title Forgotten um, But Not Gone and that's an open um, webinar that people can join um, which we'll be um, sharing links through our website um, that Mary is giving um, for the organisation Tide together in dementia every day so do encourage people to tune into that if they wish. This webinar like all of the other recordings um, will be posted up on our website so if you wish to watch it again or share it with other people please do and please do feel able to join also our online forum, which is especially for family carers and of people living with dementia who want to connect in a safe way online virtually with each other. So thank you so much again, Colette, um, and thank you to thank everybody for joining us.